it's an honor to be here this morning and I, I think how timely is this that you're visiting San Antonio and we're talking about heat problems and, and heat stroke and I'm assuming everybody out here in the audience has learned during your stay here that you drink water not margaritas. <laughs> Have you understood that? Okay. Uh, so I hope that has happened. Uh, the other reason it's extremely timely for our campus and one of our athletic trainers is sitting in the audience, Rody over here, and we are starting football and uh, I had a meeting this morning to, uh, to raise funds, but we are also at nine o'clock started registration for our first football camp for ninth graders and youngers, younger kids. And while I was sitting here and listening to this, uh, I'm thinking I need to get back to campus because uh, it is hot. And when we looked at, we have the infill of our track, we don't have a football stadium and we put lines on it yesterday to kind of have a football field and we're putting those little ones out there and it's been extremely hot. So we had meetings about what are we going to do to accommodate this? And of course, like what a lot of people do, we've already been running baseball camps and soccer camps all week, but all of a sudden we're in this panic because we've got football camps starting today. So we're putting a tent out there with a mister and all that. And I asked our staff, so, you know, what it, did we think about these other things? This is an extremely important issue. And when I first got called on this, I thought, what is my fit into being um, on this panel here uh, with all these people that are so prestigious in this field? But the more I read the information and thought about the different roles I have played in all the years I've been in sport, from a student athlete to a coach to a mom and now to an administrator, when you think back through the primary, the priority that I have had to focus on through all those situations is student athlete welfare and making sure that they're in a very good experience but a very safe environment. And then as an administrator, I, I stepped out of coaching uh, in 94 <coughs> and as an administrative, that word liability. Uh, you know, hit you in the face so many times in trying to be proactive and, and to think through what is a way to have a safe to have a safe environment. As you know, I grew up in a time as a player, just like Mr. Gervin talked about, um, where you didn't take water breaks. There was no air conditioning, and if if the worse you practice, the more you ran and the less water you got. And then, you know, every once in a while somebody would hand you a stop tablet and that was supposed to help. You know, we, we had no understanding what, what we were doing. Moving to a coach, then you carry some of the, that same culture with you in that you want, you want to win. I mean, that's your job. And you want the kids to be intense and you want them to be tough. And you get caught up in this thing. When I started coaching at a collegiate level for women's basketball, we weren't even under NCAA rules at that time. We were still AIW. There were no practice limits. We practiced year round. We practiced as many hours as you wanted to every day. Um, and you get in this, this thought pot pattern that in order to win, you've got to practice more. As you mature as a coach and you learn that sometimes less is better, that there, there is a need for rest, and even tr nutrition, uh, learning about nutrition, that there's a certain way to eat before you practice, there's a certain thing you need to eat right after practice. There's a tremendous amount of education that needs to be going out to the coaching ranks um, on, on that. So I, I, this, this is very, very beneficial, and I really appreciate the opportunity to have been involved in this because I've learned a lot. We have a great athletic training staff at our campus, but we don't have enough. We don't have enough resources, but we can still concentrate on putting some policies together and we will be very, very supportive of this, especially as, as we're starting football. I think on a more personal issue is as a mom. I have one child and I'm an older mom and she came along and it, w it was great. But we found out when she was born that she had a heart defect and didn't really understand what that meant till she was about four months old and we had a uh, heart specialist tell us out in the hallway and she was trying to, trying to be real nice about it. You know, well, she may never be an All-American the, on the basketball court, but she can be an All-American in the classroom and I thought I was gonna pass out. <laughs> you know? And I, I, our team physician, I was coaching at Texas A&M at the time and our team physician uh, was also our pediatrician and as a very silly person, I went to meet with him and I sat in his office in tears. I could not imagine my child, and my husband was a baseball coach at A&M, I was a basketball coach. We had this beautiful baby and she can't play? 
you know, I, I, I didn't, how, what do you do? You know, how do you make friends? Well, I, uh, I know, I know it's sick, it's sick. We gradually, we gradually got over it, but we also were in a situation um, that her condition allowed her to be approved for activity. But I had a, a cardiac specialist in Houston that kept telling me when she was five or six, the worst thing she can do is play basketball. The worst thing she can play, do is play basketball. And, and we, but we kept working through it. They kept approving her uh, for practice. And then the end of her sophomore year in high school, uh, we have a very good <coughs> cardiac specialist here. And he said, you know, she's still pretty healthy, but we need to fix this. So we had a daughter that went through open heart surgery, had uh, two valves replaced with the Ross procedure, and uh, an unbelievable surgeon right here in San Antonio, Santa Cristo Rosa Hospital. Unbelievable process. And the first thing that Lauren asked when she woke up, when she woke up, was, "Can I play?" <laughs> um, and yeah, she's playing. And but the thing that was scary. And, and I would be one of these people that when they said one is too many, yeah, baby. <laughs> because when we went, when, when she went back, we're in a high school situation that has one athletic trainer. They have two gyms. And the gym that the girls were in is not air conditioned. Her first time back is in August in Texas to start basketball practice in an unair conditioned gym. And I was scared every day. We would go to fall practices where you go around to the different high schools and have these little mini scrimmages. Not, the girls are not in the air-conditioned gyms. There are no trainers there, no athletic trainers there. This, this is serious biz, and it's serious right here in San Antonio, and we're going to have to address it. Um, realistically, I think my concerns on getting these guidelines into play is that there's going to have to be a tremendous amount of education a tremendous amount of communication, and they're going, we're going to have to address resources from air-conditioned gyms to staffing to just the education process. And it's got to come to parents, and it got to go it, on a high school level, secondary level. It's going to have to be with the school board, the superintendent, the principal, the coaches, because politically getting our athletic trainers in a place that they're empowered to help really enforce these will be a difficult process. So hopefully by making this announcement today and bringing this to the public, we can all come together and really start working through this process to make sure that these guidelines become mandated practices. Um, but thanks to all those in the room that are athletic trainers. You all are wonderful. And um, as an old coach, I couldn't have lived without you. Um, but I, I really appreciate the, the opportunity. And I'm going to get back to campus and, and, and check on those little football campers. Okay, thank you.